Well, good morning, everyone. As we reach nine o'clock, I uh, want to say welcome to BCE Ag Today on August 26th, 2021. Uh, we thank you all for joining us today as we're joined by Dr. Dalia O'Brien, small ruminant specialist. Today, Dr. O'Brien is going to be sharing us some up-to-date information on your livestock. And we shall also be covering a little bit on the launch of the Mobile Processing Unit Certification Program in Virginia. Just to cover a few things before we get started, we do ask that you hold any questions that you have until the end of the session, at which point we'll open it up for discussion. Um, if you have any specific questions that you'd like to ask the, uh, Dr. O'Brien, you can cover that then. Or if you'd like, you can put your questions and comments into the chat box, and we will be sure to monitor that as we go along. Um, with that, thank you, Dr. O'Brien, for joining us this morning. Um, if you are ready, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you. Okay, thank you, Trent. Am I able to share? I think you should be able to. Let's see. Laura, can you um, bear with me? Yes, cool. it's the same disabled on my end. Perfect. Okay. You should be good to go now. Yes. And are you seeing my presentation? We are indeed. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Laura and the team for inviting me um, here today. So as Trent um, said, I'm Bailey O'Brien. I'm the Small Ruminant Extension Specialist. And today I'll be providing a small ruminant um, update. So I will highlight a few updates that I'm excited about and I think are important for Virginia um, sheep and goat producers. And these updates include efforts that the issue is directly involved with. As such, um, some of the topics I'll, covered in, I'll cover include um, VSU's forage-based continuous lamb production research and demonstration study, um, the battle against those pesky worms, um, the Southeastern system-wide meat goat research project, highlights from a small ruminant producer processing meat survey that was conducted, I think it was late spring or early summer, and then talk a little on the launch of our small ruminant mobile processing unit um, certification program that actually starts um, this weekend. So we're excited about these things. So the first update is on VSU's forage-based continuous lamb production um, research and demonstration project. There was a field day scheduled to highlight these results. I believe it was a week or two ago. However, we had to reschedule. Um, but we do plan to put this program back on the books. We plan for about mid-September, so please look out for that. But this project is a collaboration between VSU, Virginia Tech, and Laval University. Um, and the major or overarching objective is to develop and demonstrate a model for year-round lamb production and marketing using cool and warm season pastures and annual um, forages. So essentially, VSU has a youth flock of approximately 64 breeding youth. And we have land-raised pear sheep breeds that include St. Croix and Barbados black belly. We have two subflocks. We've got a flock A and a flock B, and they're bred four months apart so that we're lambing every four months. It can be intensive because of breeding and lambing man management. A lot of work has to go into this, but the breeds that we have at VSU, they do well on pasture, have great mothering ability. They lamb on pasture easily and they're parasite resistant. So it makes them ideal for this forage-based study that we're undertaking. And um, they're ideal for the environmental conditions that we have in, in Virginia. 
So lambs are weaned at approximately 60 days of age and men or youth have about, six, about 30 days to recondition for synchronized breeding um, for about 25 days. Lambs are weaned, as I mentioned, at 60 days of age and they're kept in semi-enclosed pens for about two months before they're placed on, on pasture um, for, for with, with other lambs um, until they get to a market weight. And when they get to a weight of 35 to 40 kilograms, 35 for females, 40 for males, then we, we market them at the, the auction. So we breed the beginning of March, July, and November, and then lamb, subsequently lamb in August, December, and April. So it's quite busy with breeding and lambing um, at the issue. So we have two years of data that we've analyzed so far, and I just wanted to give you, just give you some, some highlights of some of what we've, we've found. So when looking at overall youth performance, we see that um, numerically, we have higher pregnancy rates during the normal breeding season of November compared to the traditional, um, the transitional breeding seasons of March and um, July, which is in spring and summer. However, as you can see that pregnancy rates for both the two first years of the studies, they were all above 75%. When looking at litter size, again, we see a larger litter size or a greater litter size above two from the November mating, which again, remember that's their natural breeding season compared to July and March matings, which are more traditional um, transitional breeding seasons. When we look at lamb survival, um, looking at the number of lambs that survive at birth, and look at those that survive, the percentage that survive from birth to weaning, we see that survival at birth is lowest in July breeding. And this would mean that's a December lambing. So we have lamb survival lowest in, in, in our July breeding compared to our March and November matings. Um, and then survival from birth to weaning, it's similar um, among our breeding seasons. In terms of our lamb body weight at, la at birth and weaning, we find that lamb weight or lamb um, birth weight is heavier in the March than July matings with November in the middle and weaning weights are generally heavier for or November, um, November lambs um, compared to our March and, and, and July lambs. In terms of lamb production on pasture, again, we lamb every four months. And so we have different cohorts from each breeding. When we look at the different cohort sizes, so this is a size that we have from each breeding, we can see that it ranges from about 30 to 53 animals. So these are the animals that we have every four months to add to our lamb, lamb flock for a continuous supply of lamb throughout the year. So you can see that it ranges from about 30 to 53. Um, one year is highlighted here where we had only 14 lambs. And that year, um, we actually had lambs being picked off by coyotes. So we've had to change our management since then to, to, um, to account for this so that we, you know, we don't have them, them being picked off by coyotes. Um, I mentioned that we market at target weights of 35 to 40 kilograms. You'll see that there is a range in age to target weight and, an, and, a, and a range also or variation in the percentage of lambs reaching target weight as yearlings. Um, these both depend on the project year as well as the birth season. And the earliest age over the different lambing seasons was five months of age. And we've had a range of about 53 to 100% reaching target weights before 12 months of age. Um, the 53% seems to be an, an anomaly. And every other year or every other breeding season, we've had close to um, three quarters or more being um, reaching that target weight. 
so that we could take them off to auction. So overall in that study, some of what we've, to summarize some of the results that we have, we've essentially um, observed that there is a variation in pregnancy rates during the transitional season, especially compared to that normal breeding season. Um, and this suggests that, that, that um, there's potential to achieve higher pregnancy rate during these periods um, through improved management practices. Um, the litter size, however, was consistently lower during that transitional breeding season. Um, lamb survival at birth was not influenced by the breeding season, or sorry, lamb survival was influenced with those being born in December, having less lamb survival, less percentage of lamb survive, but lamb survival to weaning was not affected by breeding season. And overall, we believe that this data indicates that the production system demonstrated at VSU can produce cohorts of similar size of lambs that can produce a consistent supply of lamb for direct marketing throughout the year. So as I mentioned before, it can be, this system can be, be pretty intensive in terms of management for breeding and lambing. However, it pro provides um, producers doing a similar system with an opportunity to have um, lambs, different cohorts of lambs um, and different groups of lambs that can be marketed each month, especially in times of the year when lambs are short because most other producers are just breeding during the fall breeding season. And this might give them a leg up um, or an advantage um, in, in, in having lambs on market when no one else has. So that could give them more profits in their, their production system. And the, 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 it's important to note too that this is a forage based system. So minimal, minimal input in terms of, of, of feeding. And, um, and we have demonstrated that this can be done effectively in this environmental condition in Virginia. Um, the he or she field day that will be rescheduled for September will have more results from this, this, this project. Um, we are excited about the results from this project. And again, we think that, that um, he or she producers could benefit a lot from some of what, what we're doing at BSU. So now looking at parasite control, as most of you know, the number one health problem in sheep and goats is internal parasites. And this is because small ruminants are extremely susceptible because of their grazing pattern. Um, we know that, that overuse and misuse has led to multi-drug resistance in parasites. So most farms, um, there are worms or parasites that aren't only resistant to one class of drugs, they're resistant to multiple classes of drugs. And this makes it and, and, and this makes it very hard to control worms um, on most farms. Over the years, we've been promoting sustainable integrated parasite management um, strategies, including targeted selective treatment where you don't deworm the entire group, only target those animals that need to be dewormed and, and leave, leave the rest. We've been targeting using tools like the matcha and the five point check and using fecal accounts, genetic selection, pasture rotation, um, et cetera. These are some things that we have been promoting so that producers have a holistic approach in fighting um, internal parasites on their farm and are not depending solely on, on drugs. Um, one of the most promising methods or exciting methods that, that, that came available, became available for producers over the last um, couple of years is, is the availability of the fungus that Antonia clay grass. All right, and so we know that when you consider infections or, or worm infestation in animals on a pasture, we know that about 10% live inside the animal and 90% are on that pasture. So if we have a product that's effective in reducing the worm count on pasture, then this limits that animal's exposure to parasite larvae and reduces overall worm counts. Research has shown that this fungus 
is effective in reducing worm counts by 70%. And results are consistent across species. So in cattle, horses, sheep, and goats, we see consistent um, results. And basically this fungus works by when it is consumed by the animals, it survives passage through the digestive tract, germinates and spreads on the feces, producing specialized um, nematode trapping structures that basically restrict the development of that parasite larvae on pasture. In order for it to be effective, it has to be fed every day for at least 60 days during the parasite season. And we do recommend that you feed it to animals that are most susceptible, such as um, young animals. Um, in Virginia, our parasite season is anywhere from May to September or October, depending on the year. So they like warm, moist temperature. So this product, if a producer purchases it to use it for worm control, um, and say, for example, they're dosing a 50 pound lamb or kid, it will cost them at the current cost, it costs about 25 cents per lamb or kid. And this amounts to about $15 for 60 days per animals. So the cost can add up if you have you know, a higher number of, of animals. Say you're just treating your susceptible animals, which might be your, your weaned lambs or kids. Then if you have 20 weaned animals, this can cost you upwards of 300 dollars or more to treat this group. So a lot of producers find this, 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 um, this treatment to be not cost effective. Um, and so we haven't, um, I don't get a lot of feedback from producers using it. If there are any agents or producers out there listening um, that are using it, I would appreciate some, some feedback because I just don't know of many producers that are, 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 are using it just due to the cost. Um, however, there is research currently being done to demonstrate how best to use this fungus on farms. So there might be other ways that you could use it to help control the worms. One project, one funded project um, currently at Delaware State University with CSU um, collaborating and will be conducting some of this research is looking into feeding um, this product every other day. So instead of daily for the 60 days, feeding it every other day for, for 60 days to see if it is um, as effective as feeding it um, every day. Additionally, this project is looking into developing new feed supplements with bioworm or with the fungus that might be cost effective for many producers to incorporate into their, their production systems. Um, another exciting project that, that DSU is also involved with is the use of bioworm or the fungus to facilitate the re replacement of resistant, drug resistant parasites with a population of drug susceptible parasites. So there's been a number of research done earlier in, in um, earlier, say the early 2000s, there was a number of research done to, to look at the, the effectiveness of actually cleaning animals out. So treat them with an effective um, deworming protocol, get their fecal accounts down to zero, and then inoculating them with a group of drug susceptible parasites and allowing them to, to dilute pastures with these drug susceptible parasites so they can pick these up while, while they're grazing. And studies have shown that this is an effective, um, this can be highly successful. However, they did find that after about a year and a half or 18 months, you had a group of, of resistant worms that was able to come back. So it is highly successful initially, but then after, mm -hmm. after 18 months or so, it is not. So we're involved with a study that's trying to look at feeding by a wormer during that period where you deworm those animals and trying to clean them out completely. So feeding by a wormer to help to reduce the parasite resistant worms that survive and are on that pasture. And we believe that if we can reduce those numbers 
and we inoculate with that sub that population of drug susceptible worms, then this method of this could be a highly effective method on many farms. So we'd be able to go on a farm and, and be able to replace those drug resistant worms with drug susceptible parasites so that producers are better able to, to control worms on their farm. So we're very excited about doing these pro, um, projects and very excited about getting the results into our agent's hands and into um, our producer producer hands. So another project um, we're excited about um, is a Southeastern system-wide meat goat research project. So currently the US is a net importer of goat meat. We cannot satisfy domestic um, goat demand, goat meat demand with domestic production. And there is little information out there on consumer preference and marketing for goat meat and goat meat products. Um, the American Sheep Industry and the Lamb Board have done an excellent job in, in, in doing consumer and marketing studies and trying to promote American lamb um, in the US. However, there has been no group in the US to take the lead with, 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 um, with goat, meat goats and try to help our producers in developing, um, developing markets and marketing opportunities for their meat and meat products. So, um, this Southeastern system-wide project involves seven 1890s land-grant institutions, including VSU, and we've all been doing um, meat goat research for decades now. Um, and we're trying to better understand um, consumer preferences for goat meat so that we can take this information and help to develop more effective marketing te techniques. And additionally, with the absence of, as I mentioned previously, effective methods of um, parasite control, there are many goat producers who are getting out of the, the, the goat industry. I know a lot of producers who, who, who get in excited. Um, they've been told that meat goat production is profitable. Um, they can make money in it, they jump in. And soon after they're, they're, they're exiting the meat goat industry because of issues with internal parasites. As you know, goats are more susceptible because they're natural browsers. And we are basically raising them in, in production systems that force them to, to, to graze. So they're more susceptible, um, susceptible to, to internal parasites. We also have some producers who are hesitant to start because they've heard that there are parasite issues and you can't effectively control it. So in order to make goat, pro goat production more, more viable and sustainable, one of the obje objectives of this study too will also evaluate novel methods of sustainable internal parasite control. And this will look at biowormer um, as well as looking at genetic selection in, in, um, in helping producers to better deal with, with parasite. Um, resistance, because as you know, if we can't overcome this problem, then we can't, there's no reason to be doing these consumer preference studies and marketing studies to help our producers. So that's an important part of, of this, this project as well. So in the near future, we will be um, soliciting producer participation in surveys, um, maybe one-on-one -on -one interviews in, in order to get feedback um, feedback from producers about what they're doing in terms of marketing, what they believe is successful or not, because there are some producers out there who are successful. And we want to take that template and be able to pass it to, to other producers as well, as well as introduce new and novel ideas for marketing this. And additionally, we need mainstream consumers, mainstream US consumers, not just ethnic consumers, to, to open their minds and open their homes to, 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 to goat meat and goat meat product, um, products. So we're excited about that project because this is the first large scale project will be, that will be um, undertaking um, these objectives in the Southeastern region of, of the United States. So um, another update that I have is on a survey that we did in the spring or, or early summer trying to determine the processing needs of our sheep and goat producers in Virginia. And I wanna thank for any agents that are on here 
or list them um, for getting the survey out to our clientele and for any producers who participate in the, the survey. So this was a survey that was developed in Qualtrics and it was, as I've mentioned, distributed by or, or VCE agent to, to producers. So it was open for two weeks and we had about 110 responses. 65 um, participants actually indicated their location by county. Um, 39 counties um, were represented, so this is over 40%. So I think that's a very good res you know, response um, from our counties. Um, the, the biggest response was from um, Loudoun and Montgomery County. This um, table shows the demographics of, of our respondents. So um, the majority of our, our um, survey participants raised sheep, 54%, um, as you can see, 28% um, raised goats and about 17% raised bulls. Um, when asked how large their operation was, um, close to 60% had small herds of about 20, 20, 25 breeding um, age females. Um, one of the questions that we asked, um, I, I didn't include all the questions we asked, obviously due to time, but I just wanna highlight some of the responses that we got. So the, when asked, where do you sell most of your lambs or kids? And this was live animals. Um, the majority of them indicated that they sold direct sales of breeding stock and or, or live animals, followed by non-traditional markets and then traditional markets. When asked what type of processing do you utilize the most, it was split between custom plant, that is slaughtering for home consumption only and federal um, and processing it at a federal inspected processing um, um, plant. And the 20% was from state inspected processing plants. This was a little bit um, surprising. How many animals do you harvest? I guess it wasn't, but how many animals do you harvest? or process each year. And the majority of respondents only process one to, to five animals um, per year. Um, in the comment section of the survey, many producers indicated that um, they wanted to expand their marketing opportunities. Um, however, they are limited in terms of um, the availability of federally inspected processing facilities um, in Virginia, um, and not only limited in terms of the number, but the distance in which they had to travel to get to these, and, um, and then also in terms of, of, of scheduling, because a lot of producers, as you know, feel that they're, they're put on the back burner. Processing, processing plants make more money processing cattle um, and other species compared to sheep and goats. And so, they feel like a lot of times they're at the, the, the um, they're just not considered priority when it comes to, to processing. Please indicate the months of the year that you typically harvest the most. These months include September, October, and November. So it's in the fall months that you have most processing um, taking place. Have you experienced any scheduling delays in processing recently? You can see that over three quarters of producers indicated that yes, we yes they have, and we knew that this was an issue even before COVID, and then COVID just just um, it it sort of expanded this issue that producers have been having. Um, we asked would a mobile processing unit um, that allows federal, state, and custom slaughter be an asset. The producers in your county and 94 94% indicated yes. Would you be willing to butcher your own animals on the federal inspection, utilizing the mobile unit at a reduced processing fee? And 65% um, of producers indicated yes, they would. And um, this question was included because we were trying or, or we've been trying for, for maybe months or years now, really to try to figure out how best to launch this mobile unit as a resource for or, or sheep and goat producers um, in the state. And so this takes me into the launch of our mobile processing unit certification program. As I mentioned, the, it will start 
um, this coming weekend. We're extremely excited about this certification program. And um, we're, just, we're just excited to get it in the hands of our producers and, um, and opening up marketing opportunities for these producers. So the certification program, um, I've gotten a number of questions about it and I wanted to take this opportunity to, to clear up some of that. But the, the certification program includes four online modules. Um, so they will include lecture assignments um, or due after each med, uh, module and there'll be quizzes. And these modules um, go over the, the unit design, the, um, how we plan to launch or use the units. It goes over how to humanely you know, harvest and process these animals, the, the science of red meat processing. It goes over marketing. Um, and it, it includes a one, um, a two day hands-on module on the mobile processing unit, how to set it up, how to break it down and how to do your own butchering and um, carcass fabrication. Um, for liability reasons, only those producers or those, those participants who have um, completed the training will be able to use the NPU and um, equipment that are on board. Um, so I wanted to, to make sure that, that folks understood that. So in terms of a leasing agreement, um, this will be an agreement between VSU and the mobile unit on uh, um, certified producer. They're able to lease the unit. The unit comes with everything that's on board, all the equipment, including, um, um, including knives, um, a, a bandsaw, meat saws, um, packaging supplies, um, and producers are able to lease this with everything, everything on the unit. Um, they can lease it for a term of four days. This will be during the week, so Monday to Friday, not over weekends. Um, and four days allows for two kill sessions, with a kill session being defined as the slaughter and processing of 15 animals. We are limited by or, or cooler capacity. There's a cooler on board the unit for hanging the carcass. Um, and we are limited by that. And we think it could probably hold about 15 or 16 animals on that, on that cooler. So a kill session is basically two days, the first day for, for slaughtering, the second day for cutting up, and so you could do two sessions in four days. The cost of leasing this unit would be $100 for use of the NPU, all the equipment, and an additional base fee of $15 per animals, just as an overhead for packaging and, um, and, and maintenance, so we can keep up with, with our supplies on the unit. Um, requirements for the mobile unit setup at specific locations, so these can be set up on a produce, the unit can be set up on a producer farm or in any other approved location um, in Virginia. Um, the requirements are that you have potable water hookup. The unit does come with a water tank with a capacity, I believe, of 100 gallons. However, the, the water pressure is just, I believe is just, it's, it's or we believe, it's just not quite sufficient. So we're looking into replacing that pump, but a, if you had a water hookup, then this would be ideal for using, um, using the unit. Um, an electrical hookup or diesel, it does have a generator, um, a diesel run generator. So you could run it on, on, on the generator or you can have an electrical hookup as well. Um, some way to compost um, the, 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 the hide, head offal um, from that, that slaughter process and an area or field for land application of the wastewater. So services the unit will provide, you can do either custom slaughter for your own home consumption, or you can do state and federally inspected um, 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 processing on the unit. The issue would be if this is something you desire 
you know, state or federal inspection. And remember, state inspection just allows you to sell your meat in Virginia, while federal inspection allows you to sell your meat in Virginia and across state lines and even internationally. Um, then you would, when you schedule to lease the unit, you would let the unit coordinator know, and we would schedule to have an inspector on site. And this is why the unit is run during the week and not on weekends, because there are no inspectors available um, on the weekends for doing this. So again, we're excited about this, and we're looking forward to launching it and, and um, possibly Again, just opening up some marketing opportunities for our sheep and goat producers in the state. Finally, before I finish, I want to put a plug. Um, I, I want to also mention that um, September 20th to 21st, we're going to be doing a virtual, not BSU, but it's an 1890s initiative. We have the fourth national goat conference schedule. So this has been sent out for agents. Um, and I'm sure many of you producers have seen this, but it's a virtual conference and um, it goes over many topics associated with, with, with goat production. And um, I think it would be very informative for our agents and producers to attend, um, attend this conference. So I just wanted to put a plug in for that before um, finishing, finishing up my talk. So I know I'm a couple of minutes over, but um, that completes my update. Um, yeah, so I'll stop my share and turn it over to, to um, Trent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. O'Brien. There's a lot of great information. I think a lot of folks are, are very excited about the launch of this mobile processing unit. Um, at this time, we are gonna go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, so if anybody has a question for Dr. O'Brien, you can either unmute yourself um, or you can type your question into the chat box um, and we will take it from there. So at this point, let's just go ahead and open it up. Unmute yourself if you have a question for Dr. O'Brien. All right, I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. Um, again, you can unmute yourself by clicking on the participant list and unmuting or down in your bottom left corner, there's a little microphone. You can click on that. If you have a question, just go ahead and tap that unmute button and uh, you, can, you can speak freely. And also, if you have any suggestions for, for, um, for any areas of, of, you know, for, any programs or anything that you would like to see um, coming out of, you know, of Virginia Research and Extension, then please, please let us know. Because feedback from more producers is important in designing or, or research and extension programming. All right, Dr. Brown, we have a question in the chat box that just came in. Two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. um, first, first one for the state and USDA inspection options. Is there any difference in cost for the slaughter option over the normal for home use slaughter? No, there, there, there will not um, be any difference because inspection is, is, it doesn't cost to get an inspector um, on site for the state and federal inspection. And so whether you're doing custom or state or federal, then the, the leasing cost will be the same when using the mobile unit. All right. Another question we have here in the chat box. Um, are you aware of any locations in Southwest Virginia that can be approved to bring the mobile processing unit to? 
<laughs> That's a hell of a drive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say there is a there is a possibility. If there's a demonstrated need in that area, um, then I'm sure there'll be opportunities for bringing it bringing it to that that area. Remember, at, it's 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 um we we really want to start out small because it's just one unit and we're limited in how many animals we could kill um or or harvest at each um at each you know at each kill session and so we want to be able to 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 start out slow to see exactly what we can can manage but the unit does come with a unit coordinator and the unit coordinator will be willing is is his his job is to bring this unit out to different areas in Virginia. So essentially I'll say it's it's you know it's a you know first come um it's gonna be on a first come first serve basis where where if you have producers out there certified and they want the unit then we will bring it there um and it's it's basically getting getting your area in before scheduling becomes too hectic, basically because we think that there's going to be um, there is a real need for it, and we think that many producers are going to be interested in you know interested in using it, and so the demand um, at some point might be overwhelming. Or we're hoping I should say we're hoping that's going to be the case, and and so. If you get in really early, then there's definitely a possibility of getting that in, Amanda. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat box. We'll give it a couple more moments. Not seeing anything. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as thank well you as for having me. Certainly, certainly. A lot of great, valuable information um, that I hope that all of our viewers were able to, uh, to use well. Um, we thank you to all the viewers for tuning in. Our next BCE Ag Today session will be held on September 9th. We hope that you're able to join us then. Um, before we leave, we want to thank our BCE agent production team. Laura Maxi Nay, Stephanie Ramelchek, Robbie Longest, and Frank Long. Uh, before you tune out today, if you have not done so already, please take the time to go ahead and fill out the evaluation. Um, you can see that uh, code on the screen as well as the link. You can scan that code using your uh, camera phone, and it'll take you right to the evaluation. We use those evaluations to, uh, to gather information on what you want to hear. Uh, you know, what upcoming programs you would like to have additional information on. So the more evaluations that we get, the better we can tailor the, uh, these sessions to serve our audience. So please take, take some time to fill that out. Again, thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you for everybody listening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for tuning in today. We hope you have a great rest of your Thursday. And be safe, everyone.